Hey everybody, Sam Saggers here, just giving you some insights into NIMBY real estate with a case study on Belimba and of course a little property which we think is going to make a great investment in Belimba. But first let's start with NIMBY real estate. Of course NIMBY means not in my backyard. Why is that powerful? Because it actually is the concept of finding suburbs which are really, really tightly held, undersupplied, and really for the long-term viewpoint of our big cities, never really going to get truly supp supplied. So if we think of Sydney, suburbs like Wallara and Paddington are very NIMBY, there's no development, there's no real new production of stock going into those suburbs. If we think of Melbourne, could be like a Turak or an Armadale, uh, suburbs which are very heritage orientated, and of course, uh, by virtue of that, are very, very protected, not in my backyard suburbs. Now, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane are well on their way to doubling their population. So think about just how valuable tightly held enclaves are going to become over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Depending on how long you're going to be a property investor for, I think owning a NIMBY piece of real estate is quite smart thing to do. NIMBY suburbs, of course, are just fantastic suburbs from a blue chip point of view. They tend to hold their value very well in a downturn and in an upswing tend to perform very, very nicely. They're seldomly traded suburbs. They're hard to get into. And once you get into them, you tend to want to own that real estate for a very, very, very long time. Of course, NIMBYs themselves are a group of people usually associated with the suburb. They're locals. They're proud locals and they fight very hard to protect the look and feel of a neighbourhood. That's what makes NIMBY suburbs quite attractive investments is because they have people with inside them that actually want to look after that suburb for a very, very long time. This is powerful because NIMBYs will object to development. They will, uh, over, over the course of... Um, uh, uh, a long period of time, look after a suburb, uh, make sure the look and feel of the suburb is protective. Whether that's a McDonald's coming to town, whether that's a new restaurant opening, or whether that's a new um, development. NIMBY suburbs are tightly held uh, neighbourhoods with really, 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 really strong local voice. And Belimba is no different. Belimba is a suburb which is heritage and has house proud people living in it that want to protect the beautiful look and feel of the neighborhood. Now, Belimba itself um, is a classic example of a NIMBY neighborhood. There's only 45 DAs lodged in the suburb since 2015. Mainly, uh, they are renovations or extensions. So 90% of those are actually just DAs around houses, maybe getting a new deck, maybe getting a second story, that kind of concept. Uh, the two biggest sites that uh, essentially were up for DA were around 50 apartments. So that's all that the suburb was, was taking on. And uh, there's been six new DAs lodged, in fact, this year, and they are all sub 10, very boutique kind of uh, uh, NIMBY kind of supply levels. So NIMBY suburbs are what we call beehive neighbourhoods. And why they're beehive neighbourhoods, they attract a person that typically stays and lives their entire life in the neighbourhood. They actually will live and die in the one neighbourhood. Once they get into the beehive, they don't want to leave. So typically what you'll find is perhaps as people get older, they will actually downsize into the same neighbourhood. And NIMBY neighbourhoods, not in my backyard suburbs, are certainly that. They are um, beehive suburbs. So some common qualities of beehive neighbourhoods. Well, firstly, they're very aspirational. Lots of wealthy people want to try and get into the suburb. It's seen as very prestigious, very luxury and from a social point of view, very, very strong. Beehive suburbs have uh, people that are essentially buyers for life. They'll spend their 50 years in the one neighbourhood. 
real estate is actually really uh, mildly volatile in NIMBY or Beehive neighborhoods. Why is that? Well, properties aren't sold as often as they are in other suburbs. People tend to hold the asset for a longer period of time. So there is less inventory level on the market. There's less stock for sale. Therefore, there's less risk of stock being sold for a loss because there's simply not a lot of stock being sold. So the stock that does get sold is usually growing in value because there is more people fiercely trying to get into the suburb. Common quality, NIMBY neighbourhoods are fiercely proud and rich areas. There is a high affluence score. So there is a good level of growth and you don't get this roller coaster growth that you might do in suburbs which have higher trades, in other words, higher uh, sales rates. And uh, that's because in NIMBY neighbourhoods, inventory stock levels are low. So trades are low. So typically what you get is constant levels of growth, whether that's 5%, 6%, 7%, nice, good, steady year on year on year on year growth, as opposed to other suburbs, which uh, still will end up growing comparably to a NIMBY suburb, but they tend to be roller coaster growth. Some good years, some not so good years, some good years, some not so good years because of the way real estate is traded. So in NIMBY suburbs, one person may hold a property for 10 years. Non-NIMBY suburbs, someone may hold a piece of real estate for three to five years. So the trade is more constant in other neighborhoods, more tightly held in NIMBY uh, suburbs, which makes them, of course, very, very attractive neighborhoods. Now, when you think about our big cities, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, there are 250 suburbs that make up the, uh, the overall city itself. From those 250 odd suburbs, only around 10% of suburbs are actually what we call NIMBY neighborhoods. They're NIMBY because they uh, essentially have low supply levels. You can't build big buildings in the landscape and quite often they have height limits. Those height limits, usually two, maximum three stories, usually in line with tree levels. So NIMBY suburbs, the landscape is typically old history. They're typically 150 to 200 year old suburbs with big, beautiful houses. Here's an example of the case study area we're looking at today being Balimba. Balimba uh, essentially has a lot of historic homes that were developed around the time Brisbane really began. So they're heritage listed and can't be removed from the suburb, they're protected. And because they look and feel very historic, of course they add a lot of charm and prestige to the suburb itself. And that is part of the reason why so many people want to connect to the suburb because of its history and its beautiful look and feel. So this is the one challenge developers firstly face is most of the suburb is actually impossible to develop because of the old history. Hence why they are NIMBY, they protect the history. The second challenge in a place like Balimba and Bulara and Pannington and Turak and Armadale and all these beautiful uh, NIMBY neighbourhoods is typically the house prices are very, very expensive, anywhere from one and a half million to $10 million homes. Now for a developer, they need to create a development site. They might have to buy three $3 million homes next to each other. Then of course, they've amalgamated a site for say nine or $10 million, but they can't go very high with their density. So they might only be able to go two or three stories, usually below the street level tree line, and that creates a challenge. That makes it very, very difficult for them to feasibly create real estate. So under town planning, NIMBY neighborhoods, of course, uh, like all suburbs in Australia, are under pressure to develop real estate. 
Australia is going for 40 million people by 2051 in a place like Sydney where there's going to be 8 million people and Brisbane where there's going to be close to 5 million people and Melbourne where there's going to be 8 million people. NIMBY neighbourhoods need to uh, be part of the production line of allowing real estate into their area. But they're very clever NIMBY neighbourhoods. What they do is say development is possible, but by controlling the height limits, they actually make it near impossible for a developer to mathematically create a development. And by doing so, preclude development. Over and above that, then of course you've got the locals who protect and look after the neighbourhood. Another attribute of NIMBY suburbs is high aspirational score. Just about every NIMBY neighbourhood uh, that is in our cities, that 10% of suburbs that are in our cities, will actually get a score of 10 out of 10. In fact, there's usually more wealth in those neighbourhoods than just about anywhere else. Why this is powerful? Well, in Belimba's case, as you can see, 30% of the suburb is made up of the highest income bracket within Brisbane. So you've got more wealthy people than you do just about anyone else. This is really, really important for investors to understand. The more wealth coming into your suburb, the more money coming into your suburb. Suburbs are just micro economies. And by virtue of being a micro economy, all of a sudden that suburb has more money in it. And therefore, usually more money means higher levels of property values. Values follow money. And we'll talk about that a little bit further on. But right now, I'd love you to understand one of the concepts that we work hard on when it comes to buying in Beehive or NIMBY neighbourhoods. The first or biggest concept is the ripple between houses and apartments in Beehive or NIMBY neighbourhoods. Generally, an apartment is around the quarter of a price of a beautiful home. So a beautiful home in a Beehive NIMBY neighbourhood might be about $2 million. But an apartment may be uh, coming in at a median value of around $500,000. So that is a huge ripple in real estate. Quite often we're looking for a big disparity between houses and apartments. Why is this so important? Well, in beehive neighbourhoods, people will live and die their entire life. A family will happen, mum and dad will get old, They'll stay in the suburb, they'll watch their kids grow up at the uh, local public and private schools. And then as those kids move out, they sell up their big family home. But where are they going in beehive suburbs? Well, they're going to stay in the suburb. They've been living in the suburb for 20, 30 years already. Uh, most people will continue that lifestyle. Their association with the community, their association with the local clubs, local restaurants and bars, and simply continue living on. Beehive suburbs are great because the downsize of marketplace is moving and because of their wealth, buying uh, apartments and paying uh, good money for those apartments. The luxury end of the beehive marketplace is trading well within apartments and the sub-luxury end as well. So the three consumers, the first one is the families. The families that are rich and wealthy with uh, lots of money will come into NIMBY neighbourhoods, places like Turak, places like Armidale, places like Woolara, places like Balimba, and buy big homes. And they will move their family in and they'll connect to the beautiful schools, the beautiful lifestyle that um, the picturesque NIMBY neighbourhoods have. They will buy their family homes, typically, typically off uh, downsizers. Downsizers, however, staying in the beehive, will head to the apartment space. Then there's the entry level buyer, which we often call dinks, double income, no kids. Quite often, they will enter the beehive through the apartment space and then upgrade to the big home later when they have a family. So you've got this sort of three groups of people buying real estate, which makes the absorption of real estate really, really healthy in a very low inventory uh, neighbourhood.
which is what we love. So of course, downsizes the spending. This is a Courier Mail article, 3rd of Feb, 2018. This is all about downsizes, downsizing from Brink Homes into Belimba's luxury apartment space. Uh, again, Dinks, executives, they want to live in some of these more picturesque neighbourhoods because they are really the top 10% of where the wealth is. If you're an executive and you can associate yourself with other people who are quite wealthy, usually you're mixing in a social realm which is quite powerful. You might meet other people that you can link and work with as an executive in NIMBY neighbourhoods. So creating equity out of real estate, it's uh, always an interesting puzzle, but one of the ways to do that is to actually find areas where there's good levels of income and moderately priced properties. So equity can be created from a market when the income supersede the property values. Say that again. Equity can be created from a market when incomes supersede the property values. So in other words, if we've got a high income and a moderate property value, all of a sudden we can create equity because the income can afford property values to increase. So let's examine 30% of Belimba. Belimba has a 30% uh, of its uh, residents earning $104,000. So on $104,000 income, uh, $104,000 plus income, you can afford a property for $1 million. You could go get a home loan and live in the home, not a rental property, a home loan for $1 million. So we know that the income for most of the suburb can afford a million dollar property. However, in Belimba, the average median value of an apartment, taking one, two and three bedrooms and squishing them all together, is $516,000. So by virtue, in fact, we could see that 30% of Belimba could actually see the apartment space rise another $474,000 before they needed a wage increase or an increase on their income. A million dollars is what they can borrow and essentially they can spend half that in the apartment space. So this is really, really good because money can afford for more money to be there. And we call this in real estate an equitable real estate marketplace. In other words, the suburb can actually create equity. If an apartment went up by $200,000, there is still a marketplace to buy it. If it went up $300,000, there is still a marketplace to buy it. And this is really, really important because once your marketplace can no longer afford for the market to grow, it simply will not grow. But in NIMBY suburbs, quite often what we see is a high ability for the apartment space to trade. Understanding the housing market, the horses usually bolted. Today, the housing market in most beehive NIMBY suburbs is one, two, three, four, five million dollars. Therefore, you probably are not going to be able to usually maintain a good level of investment as a uh, owning a property like that as an investment because you're usually paying high levels of land tax. So Belimba, so you know, is really a character suburb. It's a beautiful neighborhood. It's got Oxford Street, which is a great each street, kind of reminds me of Darling Street, Balmain for Sydney people, or uh, sort of that sort of um, South Melbourne vibe, uh, around South Melbourne markets in, in Melbourne and uh, just a beautiful, beautiful neighbourhood. Belimba also has the ferry, which is absolutely great for attracting the right person. Snobs catch the ferry. Snobs don't like getting the bus or the train. So the ferry factor is really, really important for Belimba. Uh, if you're an executive, if you're earning big dollars, you usually 
two or three stops into the city itself, uh, 15, 20 minute, nice ferry ride, and you're at the financial hub of Brisbane. One of the main things though, Bulimba is what we call an enclave or a peninsula. Why this is important? Well, peninsulas are essentially landlocked. They can't sprawl. And when you're in a landlocked peninsula with height limit restrictions, that is character, all of a sudden, you can see that there's going to be a point where just simply no supply at all can be produced in a peninsula neighborhood. Bulimba, very NIMBY, NIMBY neighborhood. So we did choose a property in this NIMBY suburb, and I'm gonna talk you through why we chose this deal out of all others. Well, firstly, the street appeal is very strong, which I'll show you, it has a, a park appeal, which I'll show you as well. Floor plans and designs are fantastic. And the complex, which is built already, is riddled with owner occupiers, which is what we love. Um, all those downsizers and dinks that have bought into the complex and are living there as home buyers already. So overview, we're looking at East Park, Balimba. It's a famous developer called DeLuca's newest residential development. It's just a short walk from renowned Oxford Street. Oxford Street is about a one and a half kilometer strip street. It's a basically a beautiful little strip shopping street. Now, Balimba is really one way in, one way out. It's not a thoroughfare. So it creates this kind of ambient village effect. You're literally, uh, if you're going there, it's a destination place. It's not a passing through kind of concept, which a beautiful high street, essentially what it is, adds so much value to the real estate. And we see that Balimba's high street, being Oxford Street, is just stunning. The building itself is uh, acclaimed. It's got some of the best look and feel design in apartment luxury living that you can imagine. The project is actually 80 apartments across a very large wide site. So it's very low rise, only two to three stories in height level. So very NIMBY below the tree line. And 51 of the properties have sold locally, but the developer who was going to keep some stock is now releasing some of the best apartments. There hasn't been a price rise, which is great. We're still buying at what people paid essentially 18 months ago. And uh, really the properties are just stunning. The site is a unique site. It has three street three frontages, two street frontages and one park frontage. The north boundary has luxury townhomes that it's connected to. The east boundary, Johnson Street, is a leafy suburban street. The south boundary is parkland and the west boundary is a leafy suburban street. The design is fantastic and really once you walk through these properties, you, you just see how bright, light, and airy they are. If anything, I think the photographs do not do it justice than when compared to walking through the property. They simply are absolutely gorgeous and stunning for the downsizer and dink market. As a property investor, they're almost too good for tenants, but the reality is the flight to quality concept is very important. If you wanna get in a beehive area, you've got to buy really nice stuff and uh, the reality is they'll walk out the door when it comes to the rental market. There really isn't a lot out there as good as this. The street appeal, as you can see, you've got the old Ponciara trees and you've got that parkland. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. This is really important because when people come to rebuy your property one day, they're going to be driving down a street with literally a hundred year old trees on it. That stuff is hard to re-emulate in modern real estate. In modern real estate, typically, you might have a, a new uh, planted landscaping being produced, but not this old look and feel. So Street Appeal is amazing. One of the reasons we chose the site, as well as you can see, or you can pick up on the parkland there. That makes up one uh, frontage of the site, pure parkland. So... 
One of the things I love about this property is the floor plans. Here's a typical one bedroom. It's over 65 square meters of internal living, big outdoor living, making a 78 square meter one bedroom apartment. If you can see for yourself just how long that kitchen is on the floor plan, the kitchen is the size of a kitchen you would find in a four bedroom house. Absolutely amazing for a one bedroom apartment. One of the best designs I've ever seen at a really affordable rate, around $450 odd thousand dollars. Now, I can tell you there is no supply of 65 square meter apartments internally in Brisbane. So Brisbane has, no, from a macro level, no supply of this stock. This would be in the lowest percentile of product being produced at this size level. So there is no stock across potentially most of Queensland of 65 square metre one bedrooms. Typically, you might get a 50 square metre one bedroom, but a 65 square metre one bedroom is virtually 20% more size but the market just simply at a macro level doesn't have that on offer. So all of a sudden you step into an undersupplied market. Over and above that, NIMBY or Beehive neighborhoods, there is no supply anyway. So a place like Bulimba just simply has no DAs being producing new stock. So all of a sudden you're undersupplied at a macro level and undersupplied at a micro level. This obviously links to future capital growth and rental growth. If we look at the two bedrooms, here's a good example. Two bedroom, two story apartments, 103 square meters internally, 24 square meters externally. That's 127 square meters, around sort of 700 odd thousand dollars for this property. Uh, again, in Brisbane, most two bedroom apartments are single story. There's no supply of double story apartments. Again, most apartments in Brisbane would be circa for a two bedroom 80 square meters not 103 square meters so all of a sudden you're getting an undersupplied product in macro brisbane and of course in micro nimby real estate there is no supply anyway so undersupplied at a macro level undersupplied at a micro level again you're getting some good capital growth double story apartment which is fantastic so what does it look like on the mathematics? Well, a one bedroom anywhere from sort of 430 to 450, you're getting that 5% return. 5% return, if you don't know what that means, is typically that's going to pay for your mortgage costs and with your tax deductions, you're going to get um, uh, a good amount of revenue. You'll end up with around $22 per week on a one bedroom positive cash flow or positively geared. Two bedrooms, uh, the yields are a little bit uh, lower, but still hitting that 4.8 to 5%. And that's coming in at about um, $600 a week on a $630,000 investment. So after tax cash flow, it's costing you about $25 a week to own an absolute gun, which will um, uh, certainly perform very well from a capital growth point of view. $25 a week to be in the top 10% of tightly held neighbourhoods with no supply, knowing that Australia is going to double its size or double its population in places like Brisbane, uh, Sydney and Melbourne. So pretty good concept to consider. We know that Brisbane has gone from a 3.5% vacancy rate now sitting equal to Sydney at about 2.3% vacancy rate. In order to help people sort of not uh, feel uh, or not get cheated out of a great opportunity, we organised in negotiations a three month rent cover should you um, not get a tenant from day dot. But uh, our property management people have looked at this property and feel like it would rent really, really quickly. So no one's too stressed out about that. But for peace of mind, sleep at night factor, there is a rent cover which is available for you if you choose to be involved. Remember, NIMBY suburbs are heritage suburbs. They're beautiful suburbs. They're of the upper echelon of ownership. I own real estate in NIMBY neighbourhoods. And I think if you are building a portfolio, at least having one property in a NIMBY suburb is very, very good. They become blue chip, bulletproof, 
real estate, perform over the short, medium and long term. And they're always very, very sellable should you need to change your situation. Uh, thanks for listening. Hope this explained NIMBY neighbourhoods and a little bit about the Balimba story as well as the opportunity that presenting itself in Balimba.